By the time they come home from school, their blood sugar's dropping and they're evil. And they kick open the front door like Starskin Hutch on a drug raid and come in the, uh, in the front hall screaming. And the mother, the smart mother, the prudent mother, instead of smacking her kid and sending him to his room, will shove a big gob of old-fashioned peanut butter down the kid's throat, shove him in the closet and hold the door shut for about 20 minutes, let him out. And the kid comes out and he feels great because the peanut butter has let his blood sugar come up. And he's had just enough of this uh, protein or um, uh, slowly released carbohydrates so he has enough energy to last maybe till supper time. Teachers say that by mid-afternoon, few of the children in a typical classroom are holding together. Some school administrators are beginning to take a stand for good nutrition. I saw the kids coming to school with uh, Twinkies. I saw them coming with candy and gum. And they were consuming large, large quantities of this during the school day. The other part of the problem that really concerned me was this, that many of the children who ate a lot of this food at the school site that I observed myself, these children were children who were having some problems with learning or with behavior. And after a while, what I did was talk with the staff there at Columbus School and with a lot of the parents, because there were quite a few parents in that area who were greatly concerned. At that site, what we did was that we decided there wouldn't be junk food allowed. That is to say, candy and gum were prohibited from the school site. Even when parents realize the health problems caused by sugary foods, they can do little to oppose the persuasive power of TV advertising. Many experts and consumer organizations have long felt that television advertising of sugary foods should be banned or at least restricted. General Foods and Kellogg's and Hershey's and the Sugar Institute are not just out there in the street peddling their product. They come into our living rooms. They talk to our children when we are not there. They talk to our three-year-olds before they can they have any sense of what is being done to them. They are taking over the role of the national nanny and national daddy and presume to tell us what is good for us. Now, under circumstances where their only interest is not that the interest of our children, but the interest in their corporate pocketbook, it is outrageous in this country that we would allow that to take place. Kids see between 20 to 25,000 commercials each year. They spend more time in front of the television set than they spend in the classroom. Over $600 million a year is spent on advertising products to children. Although I uh, believe very much in freedom of speech, I think that uh, here uh, the uh, health and well-being of our children is of greater importance than uh, restriction of the freedom of speech of advertisers. This kind of advertising of this sort of sugary concoction to children is as bad as pushing narcotics on children. In 1978, the Federal Trade Commission began a series of public hearings to better arrive at an unbiased understanding of the issues. The presiding officer and several of the expert witnesses who, who were there made the point that if a kid were to eat only what he or she saw on television, they couldn't survive. Yet that's the food that's being pushed at kids day in and day out. Highly sugared, highly fat saturated foods. After about a month of hearings um, in San Francisco and another month of hearings back in Washington, the hearing officer, who's like the, the judge in the uh, uh, Federal Trade Commission procedure, um, came out with a proposed set of findings which totally support the position of the public and the children. What the um, hearing officer found is that sugar, a principal ingredient in practically all foods, specifically advertised to children on television, contributes to the formation of dental tooth decay. The overconsumption of sugar contributes to um, obesity and overweight um, in children. And he made another finding that the overwhelming body of professional, medical, dental, and nutritional opinion, and I'm quoting this finding now, recommends against encouraging children to consume heavily sugared foods or to snack on such foods between meals. Despite repeated warnings, Americans continue to pour down the sugar. Scientists theorize that we may all be born with a preference for sweet-tasting foods. For most of us, it stays with us all of our lives. I have liked sugar, though. I used to eat, uh, drink uh, chocolate malted milk nearly every day. 
when I became interested in this question of nutrition in relation to health, and when I realized that uh, sugar is really harmful and probably is responsible for the high number of heart attacks in the United States, I decided that I should cut down my intake of sugar. For a very few people, giving up or reducing sugar ingestion is not difficult, although the temptations never go away. If your hostess has been laboring all day uh, in a hot kitchen to make a sweet dessert for her guests, it wouldn't really be polite to refuse to eat it. And uh, I uh, decided that I really looked around for hostesses of that sort. <laughs> Some people simply cannot control their sugar intake. These heavy sugar users find themselves eating more and more sugar, going on sugar binges. Well, like last night, I went on a binge in a way. Um, I had three big mugs of milk, chocolate milk, but I put lots of quick in it, you know. That's something you were asking me about at products. There are certain things like that, like carnation malted milk and uh, quick that have a lot of sugar in them. You know, it's just, I think it's probably just disguised straight sugar, so, yeah. I went on a binge last night, yeah, and I ate, um, <laughs> It's really strange because I feel guilty now, like I'm confessing to this terrible crime. But um, I ate a whole bunch of cookies and drank a lot of chocolate milk and um, ate some ice cream. Just, you know, just kept going. It got to the point where I was actually eating spoonfuls of brown sugar to make myself feel better. Towards the end of the addiction, I was consuming between, I'd say maybe it's a pound to uh, two pounds of cease candy almost every day. When heavy users decide to stop eating sugar, they soon realize that they can't. They want to, but their wishes and wants are usually not as strong as their cravings. I really feel sugar is a drug, and I feel I'm addicted to sugar, and it only takes one bite for me, and it just sets a, a, a compulsion in me that I cannot stop eating it. Once I start, I cannot stop. There does seem to be an increase in the sugar required by the sugar addict, uh, they develop what we call tolerance to it, and if you cut them off suddenly, they have an enormous sugar carbohydrate craving. Withdrawal symptoms after I stopped eating sugar lasted for about, I'd say, three to five weeks. I didn't know there were withdrawal sym symptoms at the time. I didn't know what they were, but that's when the most violent shaking was happening at night. Uh, I was, uh, didn't sleep at all. Uh, that was when it was the worst. In many ways, sugar resembles the two other substances that millions of Americans are addicted to, alcohol and tobacco. It's ironic that there is no physical or psychological requirement to use any of them. Sugar, like alcohol and tobacco, affects the way we feel. I know that if I take that instead of doing something, you know, like eating something that my people would call sensible, I, I feel better. I do. I get you know, suddenly I get a surge of good feeling. And if, like, I'm feeling bad or down or something like that, it'll really make me feel good. And I, I like it. People who depend heavily upon sugar for nutrition or for psychological sustenance are often what we call emotionally labile, bouncing up and down, high one minute, low the next. I'm, I'm a very erratic person like that. I mean, sometimes I feel great, I feel bad levels off a little bit, but I do a lot of this, you know, so, and that, I suppose sugar just goes right along with that, if it makes, you know, I mean, it just, it, I make my, I, I can kind of, I don't know how to say this, I can kind of, um, you know, help my mood if I'm, if I'm not feeling so good by it, or sometimes I can make myself even feel better by eating sugar when I feel good. Since childhood, memories of good times and celebrations are often associated with sweet things to eat. Many children and adults in emotional crisis turn to sugary foods for relief. I correlate sugar uh, foods with love. That was, you know, if you got hurt or something that always gave you a cookie or something to always make you feel better. And that's why I always correlated that with, if I always felt bad, well, if I eat something sweet, it'll make me feel better. When I am depressed, I think that I don't even uh, know how much sugar I'm eating. 